Last week, we looked at Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and raised, which raised the question, how concerned are you? And there were th four areas that Paul was mentioning that were very important. One was, how concerned are you for the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is the good message. Gospel means good news. The good news that we were dead in trespasses and sin, and we were bound for hell. And the good news is that God in his love saw the predicament that we were in and said, I need to send a remedy for man's sinful behavior. And Jesus raised his hand and said, Father, what can I do? And the Father said, you can go to earth. You can give your life. You can pay the price, and I will redeem them based on your precious blood, my son, my only son's blood. The Lamb of God would come to be the Lamb in the world. And the, father was dispatch, uh, the son was dispatched by the father, and he came. And the gospel message needs to be proclaimed. And the apostle Paul wanted to proclaim that glorious message. And so he then not only is concerned about the gospel message being proclaimed, but he was concerned about legalism, about thinking that you can get to heaven by believing a set of rules. Adam and Eve had a set of rules to, to obey. Don't eat of this tree. One simple rule. And uh, they could have looked at it as legalism, right? I could say, however, it wasn't legalism, it was liberalism. God was saying, I want you to be at liberty to love me and serve me. And the day that you disobey me and don't do what I ask you to do, you will lose that liberty. And we know what happened. And Adam and Eve brought into this world what you and I are confronted with today. And then he spoke not only about legalism, but he also talked about the false teaching and false preaching and how important it is to preach the clear message of God's word. What Jesus gave, we are to preach. Not what I think, not what I feel, but what the word of God says through the man of God, the son of God, Jesus Christ himself. And then Paul is concerned about the ministry of the church in verses 6 through 10. So the very problems that Paul was telling the church that they needed to deal with and be concerned about are the very concerns that you and I need to be concerned about. Let's make sure that we're proclaiming the true gospel uh, of heaven that is so important. Now today's message is the last point of that section, which I didn't get to really preach last week because uh, we certainly didn't have enough time. And it's a much, I think, broader issue that re requires a sermon in and of itself. And that is the issue of biblical clarity. Because everything that Paul is saying has to be based on the Word of God. And uh, he is concerned about that. So we want to look this morning at the importance of biblical clarity. I gave you an outline in your bulletin this morning, and I hope that it will be helpful to you. As we come to this particular section in verses 11 through 13, we will discover that Paul is dealing with the biblical clarity to identify the problem. If there's a problem, a spiritual problem, an issue, we need spiritual clarity to define those issues. The church has become muddled today. The word of God makes it very clear what immoral behavior is in the world in which we live. And we have our governments today and society today trying to twist the word of God and say what the Bible says is not true. And you and I need to say, no, what the Bible says is true. Unfortunately, I didn't say unfortunately, but fortunately, the Bible says that homosexuality is sinful. Lesbianism is sinful. Immorality is sinful. Now, we may not like that, but that's what the Bible says. And when you and I try to tamper down what the Word of God says, we're tampering with God himself, and we're saying, I am now God, he is not God. I will now make the rules, he doesn't make the rules. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned for people that are in these different lifestyles. We should, but we need to be honest and, and open and let them know that the Scriptures say that anyone that does these things will not get into heaven. 
And you read it over and over and over again in Scripture. So my, my concern is their salvation, not their behavior, that they understand that they'll never make it to heaven. You cannot somehow emotionalize your way to heaven or t- somehow rationalize your way to heaven and say, well, the Bible doesn't really mean that. Jesus says what he means and mean what he, what means what he says, and so do the rest of the Bible writers. And so we need to be very clear uh, about the, that biblical uh, truth. So biblical clarity is important. And then we're going to look at the second point in verses 14 through 21, dealing with biblical clarity to engage with the problem. So not only do we have to identify the problem, but then we need to engage with the problem. Now, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 6 just for a minute. And I need to ask you a question. Was uh, Peter strong-headed? How many say yes? You get an A. Was Paul strong-headed? How many say yes? You get an A. Was Barnabas strong-headed? How many say yes? Ah, You're not too sure, are you? They were, in different ways. And did you know (laughs) that they came in conflict with each other? That they didn't always agree with each other? And sometimes they even came to what we would call uh, controversial issues with each other? Uh, So let me just give you what Paul says in chapter 6. Because Paul had gone through some of those battles and he had been proven wrong. (laughs) Remember when John Mark wanted to go with them on the second missionary journey and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark? And Paul said, no way. He deserted us once. We'll never allow him to come again. And Barnabas was so strong-willed, he said, Paul, he's going with us, whether you like it or not. And Paul said, he ain't going with us, and I don't like it. (laughs) Woo, man alive. So what happens? They go in two different directions. Peter uh, was strong-headed, and in our passage today, Paul is going to have to deal with Peter. Why? Because uh, he wasn't doing what he knew was required of him as a servant of the message of Christ. When Paul is now writing in Galatians, he had learned a lot of lessons. He had matured, and so had Peter, and so had has Barnabas. And now they're beginning to recognize. Brethren, he says in verse 6, uh, 1 of chapter 6, Paul is writing, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, uh-oh, identify the sin, right? If somebody's caught in a trespass, identify the sin. Understand, don't gloss over it. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. So what do you need to do? Identify the solution. They need to be restored. How do we restore them? How do we get them back? Paul wasn't anxious to get John Mark restored, was he? He just wanted him to go on. Barnabas said, well, no, he's got some good things in him. Let's, let's, Let's give him another chance. No, 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 Paul says. So you, you need to restore them. That's not the way to restore them. Barnabas says, let him, let him see ministry in us and through us and be blessed. But do it in the spirit of gentleness. Looking to yourselves, lest you too be, uh, you too be tempted. So be sure that you have the right spiritual attitude. Now go back to our passage of Scripture in chapter 2. Paul is talking here and he begins in verse 11. But when Peter, that is Cephas, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood to be condemned. Biblical clarity requires that we be forthright with the person. Paul saw that Peter was making a major mistake and was going to hurt the church by the theology that he was moving back to rather than moving forward. 
And so he has to call Peter on the carpet, and so to speak, he forthrightly looks at him and says, Peter, what in the world are you doing? How did you get saved in the first place? You, Peter, you are the very one who ought to know more than anybody else what the message of Jesus Christ is. Why? You were with him. You were one of his leading disciples. You were right there at his side and understood his message that you could be saved only and solely by him and him alone. Peter, weren't you there when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? So why are you adding to that legalism and adding some restrictions of the law? So he has to confront him, but he he does so forthrightly. But I want to suggest to you that now he's doing it in the spirit of gentleness and meekness. Now, it sounds hard. And whenever you confront somebody, confrontation doesn't always seem to be polite. It's hard to to confront people with smooth and, and gentle hands. Do you know that? But we can do it with gentle hearts and with the right spirit. And so Paul now is trying to remind uh, Peter how important it is not to compromise the gospel, to to be clear about the gospel message. And then in verse 2, notice uh, there is the importance of not only being forthright, but being factual. In verses 1, verse uh, 12 rather, and not 2, verse 12. For prior to coming of certain men from James, that is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But uh, when they came, that is, these Jews from Jerusalem, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. What are the factual points here? Peter, when you got saved, you were seeing uh, who gets saved? Who? Wasn't there a man by the name of Cornelius? Oh, by the way, what was Cornelius? He was a sanctified Gentile, right? He wasn't a Christian. And, and God had to say, Peter, I want you to go and preach what? The living gospel, the saving gospel, the message of redemption to that heathen. Now, Lord, you know, I never touch anything unclean. And God gives him that vision of things coming down from unclean. And God says what? Take and eat. And God is showing Peter what God calls clean, don't you call dirty. And the whole world needs the gospel. And Cornelius needs the gospel. And he has a heart that's ripe and ready for the gospel. And you have the message. It's your responsibility to take the message to that ready heart. And what does Peter do? Brother Cornelius... The Lord sent me and told me that I should come to you and give you the gospel. And what happens? Cornelius wonderfully comes to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So let's be factual about about these points and and, and understand how important it is. Now you're moving away from the Gentiles. God said they could be saved, but now you're trying to say, well, we, we, don't want, we want them to know that it's important to have some legalism too. No, it's not. The pressure to conform. <laughs> Isn't that what it's all about? Confusing examples. Isn't that what it's about? Isn't Paul getting everybody mixed up when he does, uh, Peter getting everybody mixed up when he does this? As setting a confusing example, are we saved by grace or aren't we saved by grace? Is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in itself the basis of our justification or isn't it? And of course, the answer is it is. And Paul knew that Peter knew the answers It wasn't that Peter didn't understand the theology, I don't think. It's just that the peer pressure of the day. You know, it's it's easy for us to get in a group and not stand up for our convictions, right? 
How many of you have gotten to a business meeting and wanted to say something, but you didn't say it because you thought too many people thought the other direction? Coward. Well, I am too. I've done the same thing. Why? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. And then thirdly, in verse 13, you need to be faithful. Look at verse 13. And the, and the rest of the Jews joined him in this hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Woo! What does that tell us? There are other people that were being influenced by Peter's misbehavior. Good men, godly men, spiritual men. And so Peter now, uh, now has to be confronted because what he's doing is only affecting him, but it's also affecting others. When, when I read that passage of Scripture, and Barnabas was a good man, a godly man. He had been with Paul in ministry. He had been preaching at the church that Paul left him to minister to. And now they're back together again. And, and there's this kind of movement in the wrong direction. Yeah, what does that tell you? You know what it tells me? It tells me that the best of men can be weak and inconsistent. Do they want to be? No. But sometimes it's easy for us, rather than fight, to give in. Well, let's look at verses 14 through 21. Biblical clarity to engage with the problem. Well, now Paul has identified the problem. Now how does he handle the problem? In verses, uh, verse 14... He addresses the problem, and I love this, notice, but when I, Paul, saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, that is Peter and these Judaizers, I said to Peter, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how do you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? So what does Paul do here? He immediately deals with the problem, not the person. Now he's talking to Peter, and he's talking to all of the elders that are with Peter, Peter but what does he say? They, he, 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 I saw that they were straightforward about what? The truth of the gospel. What was Paul concerned about? He was concerned about the gospel. And he, he's certainly concerned about the way they're presenting the gospel. But what is his message about? Peter, Barnabas, the rest of you Judaizers, what is the real message of the gospel? The gospel message is not circumcision or not circumcision. The, the Bible message is the heart. Is the heart clean? Is the heart pure? Has the, has the heart been set right with God? Not the flesh. Oh, I can look great on the outside. And Jesus often criticizes spiritual leaders, doesn't he? For looking right on the outside, but in the inside being filthy and rotten. Can that happen to us? Are we concerned about appearance? Well, we should be concerned. But we ought not to be concerned as a matter of it meaning that we're in or out with God. But we ought to be concerned because we want our life to count for God and for others to know him as Lord and Savior and to know he's a genuine Christian. She's a genuine Christian. They believe what they believe and they stand for what they believe. Look at verse 15. Then he has to identify with the people. Well, when I saw that they were not straight... Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 15. I, I, but we, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. But what he's really talking about here is uh, he's identifying with the people. What, we, notice, he says, what are we? We are Jews. I'm a Jew just like you Judaizers are Jews, okay? But I am not basing my salvation on being a Jew or being born into the right family. You see, Paul, could he brag? He was a Jew, but he wasn't only a Jew, he was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee was one of the smaller religious groups that was very committed 
to God. The Pharisees, by and large, would be what we would call the fundamentalists of the day. Okay. But that some of them have gotten swayed aside. So Peter is a Pharisee, and he says, we are Jews. If anybody can brag about being a Jew, it's me. You know, I'm a blue-blooded Jew, and I was raised by one of the best theologians in Judaism. And not only that, I was actively participating in my faith by persecuting the church. I thought I was doing the right thing by nature, but you know what? I discovered with all of that good training and with all of that background, I was a sinner. I was on my way to hell. I would never make it to heaven even though I was a good orthodox Pharisee. Even though I was raised by one of the great theologians of the day. I was not on the right road. Hoo, 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 hoo. That's why Paul, when he meets Jesus on that road, has to spend three years on the backside of the desert and get his head all straightened out and his heart straightened out and then move in the right direction and then allow God to move him along the way so when he makes a mistake with Barnabas about John Mark, God can correct him. When he makes other mistakes along the life, he can be corrected and he can begin to see the grace of God working in his life and how it can work in the lives of others. And then in verses 16 through 19, Paul says you need to know biblical truth. Oh, what does that mean? Well, let me ask you a question there, Peter. Can you tell me what justification is? <laughs> Peter, how are you justified? How are you made right with God? Peter, are you made right with God? Because you can say, look, I'm circumcised. No. Well, can you say that you're right with God because you go to the synagogue? No. Can you say you're right with God because you're one of the influential teachers? No. So he gasped, nevertheless, knowing that a man... Now, what he's saying is the law is good as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough to redeem a sinner. <laughs> The law can only reveal how sinful we are, but the law cannot justify us from our sin. And so he's now going to show uh, uh, Peter and these Judaizers, hey, look at Jesus did everything we need to be redeemed from our sin and justified in the sight of God. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, that's me, Paul says, but through faith in Christ Jesus. That's me, Paul says. Even we, now all of you guys are with me, we have believed in Jesus Christ. Why? Why did we believe in Jesus Christ? Because the law couldn't save us, and we needed to be saved. We may be justified by faith in Christ. The law can judge sin. Only Jesus can justify the sinner. And that's exactly what Paul is bringing out now to these people. So why are you going back to that which cannot deal with the issue of sin? It can only identify sin. It can magnify sin. It can expose sin. It can declare sin. But we, we are justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For the, for the law, since by works, uh, by the works of the law, shall no flesh be justified. So the, Jesus is the one that will, will justify us. So he goes on to say in verse 18, for if I rebuild, what's he talking about? If I go back to the law and I begin to try to build my salvation and my way of redemption on the law, I that, I, that I once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Why? Because the law can't deal with sin. It can only reveal the sin. See the, see the difference what he's saying here? By the way, I was going to read this passage of Scripture from the Living Bible, but, but I didn't. So you, you read this passage in the Living Bible, and you'll find that uh, it's really refreshing. And sometimes if you have a, a little trouble and you, get, you think the Word of God is a little clumsy, Go, go to one of the other uh, 
translations or paraphrases just to get some added light. Don't depend on it, but look for it for guidance. And you'll find that some of these paraphrases and other passages of Scripture Bibles are very helpful. Don't discard them. Use them, but stick with a, a good uh, uh, translation too. So he says, um, so, so it's, it's important for us to see that uh, if I rebuild what I've once destroyed, I prove myself a sinner. Uh, for th th so he goes on and says, for through the law, I died to the law that I might live to God. Now notice, he says, for through the law, I died. What tense is that? That's the past tense, right? I died. I'm dead. I'm crucified with Christ, he's going to say in a minute. Hey, if you're crucified, are you dead? I think you are. If you're not, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> For through the law, I died to the law, that I might live to God. What tense is that? The present tense, right, school teacher? Right? So Paul is saying, what I was, I am no longer. <laughs> and it wasn't because of the law. It was because of the finished work of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And then the last point that we look at under the biblical clarity to engage with the problem is rest, rest, rest in the finished work of Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I like the way Steve read that. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I'm dead. Dead, dead, dead. Don't raise your ugly head, right? Doesn't Paul say, I die daily? <laughs> I thought he said he was dead. <laughs> he, he is dead, but he knows that that old nature raises its ugly head over and over and over again. And so we need to die and die and die and die, right? I am crucified. I am being crucified. Nevertheless, I live. Okay. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. And he goes on to say, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Wow. So what Paul is bringing out here is so clear, that we need to be clear in our biblical understanding. So it's important for you to have biblical clarity. Where do you get it? How do you get biblical clarity? Two ways. Read the Word of God. Secondly, trust the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that God has given to us the Spirit, that He will give us the insight and illumination that we need when we need it. So read the Word of God. Don't impose upon the Word of God your thoughts, your wishes. Don't come to it with all of your baggage. Come to it with an open mind and an open heart and a ready spirit and say, Lord, teach me what I need to be taught today in this moment. One of the problems is that we don't really study the Word of God. We peruse the Word of God. We cruise through the Word of God. We take a little scenic tour through the Word of God. What does it mean to study the Word of God? It means to try to look at it in its context. You need to look at it in its geographical and historical setting. You need to look at it from the view of the writers and the understanding of the people of that day, which is very hard to do. You can go back to the original languages, but understand something. Original language changes. The idioms change. We need to get all of the information that we can so that we can rightly divide the word. Oh, I heard that from somebody, didn't you? Rightly divide the word of truth. May God help us to recognize the importance of biblical clarity but just recognizing the importance of biblical clarity is insufficient in and of itself. May God help us 
to be clear and to practice what God gives to us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the message that you've given to us this morning that reminds us of the importance of biblical clarity. Father, we asked last week, how concerned are we? But now, Lord, we need to recognize if we are concerned, we need to be clear where the message is coming from and what it is saying. So we pray that your spirit will guide and direct in each of our minds and hearts and help us to look into the word of God and allow the word of God to connect with us. We pray this in Jesus' name for the honor and glory of God. Amen.